Awake and ready. <laughs> it's nice that you took your time this beautiful morning to come and spend in worship together. It's, uh, it's a lovely thing to come together. It's a real privilege to be together in this way. I'm going to start the reading or start the service this morning with a reading from um, Whispers from Eternity, Yogananda's book of prayer demands and poems. We're going to read a poem uh, from page 170 uh, called I Am Here. Alone I roamed the ocean's shore and watched the wrestling waves in brawling roar. Alive with thine own restless life, thine angry mood in ripply quiver, until thy wrathful vastness made me shiver and turn away from nature's heated strife. And then a kindly spreading sentinel tree waved friendly arms to comfort me, consoling me with gentler looks sublime. Its swaying leaves in tender lullaby rhyme singing a message that I knew was thine. Above, I saw the gageless mystic sky, and childlike in the valley dim, I sought to pry at thee and to play with thee. But in vain I sought thy body hiding there, cloud-robed, foam-sprayed, leaf-garlanded, too rare for mortal eyes to see or ears to hear. And yet I knew that thou wert always near, as if to play at hide-and-seek with me, receding when I almost touched thee, groping to find thee through the maddening fold of ignorant darkness, old as time is old. At last I ceased my search despair, my search in dim despair, my search for thee, O thou royal sly eluder, everywhere yet seeming nowhere, lost in unplumbed space, where none may clasp thee or behold thy face. In haste, I ceased my fruitless search and hide away from thee. Still, still no answer from the wrathful sea and only whispers from the friendly tree. Just silence from the limitless blue sky. Silence from valley low and mountain high. Like a hurt child, within the depths of me I hid and sulked, no longer seeking thee. When lo, unheralded, some unseen hand suddenly snatched away the all-black band that had so blinded me with fold on fold. No longer weary, filled with strength untold, I stood and watched again a laughing sea instead of wrathful roars, a gay, glad world with mystically open doors, with only mists of dreams between. Someone beside me stood unseen and whispered to me, cool and clear, Hello, playmate, I am here. It's one of the sweet um, poems by Yogananda. He had a very low interest and tolerance for organization. And he even protested when he saw the handwriting on the wall that he was to come to the United States and um, bring the light of God, bring these teachings to give access to truth seekers everywhere, to find God inside, to find access to God. Um, he protested about um, the fact that it was going to require organization. And his guru said, you know, uh, without organization, you will be ineffective, nothing will happen. But, you know, don't focus on the hive focus on the honey, focus on the divine realization in the midst that's being transmitted through. And this was okay for him. He was able to uh, reconcile himself to the life that God had asked him for. But many times during the course of that life, he um, offered back to God the burden of his service. One of, the, one of the really important things that comes, I, I, hear this, I hear this question come repeatedly across the decades of seeking God. We reach a point where we are asked, you know, to navigate through our lives. We have to figure out what's the next step for us. 
And the question that comes up is, how important is it? How do I discern whether I should apply my will or I should accept what appears to be happening? Should I surrender or should I continue to uh, assert my will and try and make something happen? And it's a really good question. It's, uh, there are many layers of answer to this question. Um, if we're learning to develop in a relative world, always, you know, um, one part of the answer is what's going to bring you uh, a greater awareness, what's going to increase your sense of connection to what's true and what's already there. And so, you know, if you are used to just asserting your will and uh, insisting on getting your own way, probably you'll expand your consciousness by relaxing and trying to tune into what's already there. If you're fairly passive and are um, incapable or just constitutionally not inclined to want to make things happen, then asserting your will is probably better than just um, surrendering or just giving in to the circumstances that are there. Uh, not always, but more often than not, that's a good way. You know, a friend of mine, she said, one, you know, when we're trying to decide how to navigate our way through life, and we have choices in front of us, usually, not always, but usually the more difficult choice is the right one. Because it's usually the one that takes us out of our comfort zone and requires us to expand our understanding and our awareness and to put out more energy. But now I'm going to talk, and so for worldly people, I mean, those, are, those are just some really good guidelines for, for people just generically, but now I'm going to talk to people who um, want more than a good life want more than a life of uh, loving God and um, want to go past the, the kind of macaroni necklace phase of, of spirituality. And I um, apologize for the metaphor, but, <laughs> you know, when we're, when we're young, you know, when we go into kindergarten, um, we, you know, we're taught to make macaroni necklaces and to put our hand in, in plaster and make a little tiny print and we paint it up and get our name on it. And, you know, we bring it home and, oh, our parents are so overjoyed. Yeah. They're so thrilled with us because we figured it out. We, you know, we've, we've kind of cooperated with the fact that giving something to others is more valuable than just being self-involved. And the macaroni necklace represents our first endeavors, our first steps into that understanding. But picture now you're in college and it's your mom's birthday and you want to get her a really nice gift and so you buy another box of macaroni and you string it real nicely on some thread and take it home and um, you, you get a lot less applause, right? <laughs> in fact, you get, you get a little bit of a bewildered, well, that's nice. <laughs> um, what's the difference? What happened? Well, of course, what happens is, you know, as we grow, we need to learn to ask not what, what do I want to give, not what, um, you know, what's convenient, but what's needed, what's important. We should be able to tune into a larger reality increasingly and ask the question, what's needed here? What's trying to happen? And how can I help that happen? It should be, of course, you shouldn't just give things. Even if it's important for the other person, you shouldn't give things that you don't feel in your heart a connection to and, and meaning uh, from. Um, but, but just giving something randomly as we grow becomes increasingly irrelevant and misses the point. The same thing is true on the spiritual path. When we start off as devotees, loving God is very important. And a simple love of God is, is a beautiful thing. But as we go forward on the path in, into our exploration of God's presence and God's presence within the discovery of that, we have to ask the question, what's trying to happen here? What would God have of me? One friend of mine, uh, she said, you know, I don't really want to be on the path because God takes everything from you. And certainly it can feel like that if you don't go deep enough in the question. But Swami's answer was very sweet. He said, no, God doesn't take anything from you. He asks everything of you. The invitation is there to give everything because it's in the giving that we discover everything about life. It's in the giving that we discover how life really works and our connection with the movement of spirit everywhere 
in nature and beyond nature. You know, anybody who's ever had a child or been around children quickly discovers the expansive, the value of expanding your, your sense of connection. You feel a native um, resonance with that being's happiness. And their happiness enhances your own. And their unhappiness certainly uh, takes away from yours. If in no other way, simply by the crying that, that invades your presence. But you can feel the despair of another individual extending that out farther and farther and farther afield until there's no point where that isn't experienced. Is how the masters would have us grow, how God would have us reclaim our sense of things. How can you abuse things? How can you abuse nature? How can you abuse other people? If you feel your connection with them, if you understand that their happiness is connected to your own, it doesn't mean that discipline isn't ever appropriate. It doesn't mean that there aren't difficult times. But if it's, self, if it's selfishly motivated, if it's driven by, you know, small and petty wants and desires, nothing good ever comes of it. And we pay the price later. As disciples, as devotees, as people who are truly seeking God. Again, the difference between Ananda and other churches, many other churches, not all certainly, but many other churches, is this isn't about feeling good with where we are. This isn't about simply coming in and loving God, listening to beautiful music and going home and just being self-involved again. This, this church, this movement of consciousness and energy into the world is about helping people have a radically different experience of the moments of their lives. You know, this beautiful poem, it's so poignant because when we don't have God, we see a world of wrathful roars. We see tension and disharmony and violence and distance all around us. We see limitations, doors everywhere that are blocked and unopened. But when we go deep enough into the inner presence, into the presence of God through meditation, he says, you know, I hide, I went inside and I hide away from him. You know, I ceased my fruitless search. We try outwardly, we try and find it through nature and hiking and backpacking. We try and find it in beautiful days. We try and find it in feeding the poor. We try and find it in, um, you know, having the right children, having the right house, having the right, we try externally and it just never works. It, it's only reflections. The master says, it's just reflections. He said, I ceased my fruitless search and hide away from me. I turned away from the outer world. And still, still no answer from the wrathful sea and whispers from the friendly tree. Nature doesn't change just because we've turned away from it. But then, like a hurt child, within the depths of me I hid and sulked. I turned inside and I, I put it all away. And I went into meditation. I went into that deep inner stillness when lo, unheralded, some unseen hand suddenly snatched away the all-black band that had so blinded me with fold on fold. No longer weary, filled with strength untold, I stood and watched again a laughing sea instead of wrathful roars. A gay, glad world with mystically open doors. And with only mists of dreams between, someone stood beside, beside me, stood unseen, and whispered to me cool and clear, Hello, playmate, I am here. God would play with us in all the moments of our days. He would have us have the courage to go way beyond the limits of our, of our conventional thinking of limitation and open doors on his behalf for the light of God, for the joy of, of God, for, for peace and harmony and wellness and goodness to flow through us into this world. Just to ground it a little bit, um, I'm reminded of uh, several moments. One of them is from the life of Swami Kriyananda. In surrender lies victory, in turning away from the, how you think it should be, after you've put out all the effort you can. If things aren't working, resting back inside, turning away from the circumstances and asking the question, maybe something else, maybe something else. Swami Kriyananda took a bus ride uh, across the country, four days, four nights after reading the autobiography of a yogi, found himself eventually, uh, through great effort, uh, in front of Paramahansa Yogananda, but only after he had been turned away and turned away and turned away and told, well, it'll take you weeks 
before you can even see him, months before you can even be accepted, you ha- or years, you have to study the lessons, it's three years long and stuff. And he was, he was getting huffier and huffier and huffier. That's not how it's supposed to be. That's not how I want it. That's not what's trying to happen here. And then he says, he thought, well, maybe I'm not ready. Maybe I'm not ready. Maybe, you know, I'm too accustomed to having it my own way. And he said, in that moment, he could feel something change. And the lady came out. He was walking out the door to leave. And the lady came out and says, since you've come so far, I'll ask him. And within moments, he'd been accepted. I told this, I've told the story before of meeting um, Swami Kriyananda. Um, it was like the second time our family had come to uh, Ananda Village for Sunday service. And, you know, um, the woman who is the co-director of Ananda up in Seattle, she was living at the village then. And uh, after service, she came up and was talking with us and said, who are you guys? What are you doing? What do you think about Ananda and stuff? And she said, you know, we're having, the community's having a pool party over at Swami Kriyananda's right after lunch. Why don't you and your family come? And I thought, oh, how sweet, how nice. You sure it's okay? I'll, I'd be happy to. We'd, we'd love to. And at that moment, Swami Kriyananda walked up. And Padma turned and said, Swamiji, this is the Glazard family. And, uh, and he said, well, very nice to meet you. And she said, I've invited them to the pool party. And he just looked right at me and he said, oh, I'm so sorry. That's for community members. And I went, inside, I could feel my, my energy drop to my sh- toe chakras, you know. <laughs> Here it was, was you know, uh, just being dismissed out of hand. But then I thought, well, this is theirs. And I just looked at him and I said, I can understand. And he said, well, in that case, you should come. In surrender lies victory. Yogananda didn't want to come here. Christ didn't want to go up on the cross. But think about if Yogananda had not come to this country. The victory of his own life and all of our lives, by extension, would be diminished enormously. Think if Christ had not allowed himself. He he had the power to say, you know, not only do I think this is a bad idea, Lord, I'm just not going to do it. I don't want to, you can't make me. Anybody here? Any petulance ever a part of your story? Okay. Think about what would have happened if he had been petulant in that moment, if he had been resistant in that moment, if he had taken the convenient and easy pathway through. Instead, he said, nevertheless, thy will, not mine. And because of that, we have both the story of the self-offering of the cross, the moment up there, when absolutely at the pinnacle of the worst possible human experience, he says, forgive them, they know not what they're doing. He offers forgiveness and a prayer for mitigation of the karma that's been created by the gesture. I mean, all that happened, you have to understand, all that happened was this, the soul incarnated to say, violence, hostility, contractiveness, selfishness, don't work, love is the answer. And in the midst of of Kali Yuga, in the midst of the Dark Ages, the only response they had was to stick him up and kill him. Stick him up on the cross and kill him in the most horrible way. And every gesture, every thought, every action has its own karma. Completes itself as it was started. And he could see the terrible pain that was going to come as a consequence of those actions. And his prayer was not for his comfort or ease or you dirty dogs or I wish this wasn't happening. It was, oh, for God's sake. And then three days later, he's up walking around. Think about that part of the story. If he hadn't gone up on the cross, walking around would not be impressive. It would just be a guy walking around. We have to understand that when we've offered, when we've reached as far as we can, we have to then say, whatever you want. And in that surrender to a higher will. You know, in the founding of of Ananda, there was a point in time where it was absolutely impossible for Ananda to keep going from every conventional standpoint. In fact, the founding of Ananda was impossible. It's miracle after miracle after miracle. And somebody went to Swami Kriyananda and said, you know, maybe God doesn't want this to happen. Maybe we should just surrender, just give up. And Swami looked at at this person and said, you know, 
if there's even the smallest chance, we have the duty, we're dharma bound to keep trying. If it's absolutely overwhelmingly impossible, then we have the right to surrender or give up. But if it's trying to happen, you know, and this is the same with founding, you know, with the change of this, this, this work here in, in Portland across the years. It's the same with the founding of Ananda Center at Laurelwood and, you know, Ananda House at Laurelwood. There are times when it's just absolutely impossible. It'd be really easy to just say, <laughs> you know, the same thing with the school over here. But every single time we've done it, we've done it because we felt a divine guidance and encouragement from deep inside. Deep inside, you have to go deep inside. If you want to live beyond the obvious, you have to go deep into the presence of God. And you have to ask the question, what's trying to happen? And you don't, you don't get to ask, um, is this going to be easy or, you know, it's, is this trying to happen? And then how can I, what's the next step? How can I help to implement it? And great forces, even a lot of friends work, will work against you. You have to be willing to stand true. You have to keep checking in. You can't just check in once and, and rest on your laurels. You have to keep checking in all along the way. But if the guidance is it's still trying to happen, you have to, against all odds, you have to show up. You have to keep going. And every single time, what you'll see, the beauty of this, this beautiful temple, the simplest, simple beauty of it, came through that effort. The, the, the beauty of the, of the community, the way it is, came from that same simple effort of just showing up anyway, against all odds. Surrendering, sometimes surrendering is to nothing happening. Sometimes surrendering is into having to just put out more energy and keep showing up. Same thing with Ananda Laurelwood. We have hit the wall endless numbers of times in the four years that that's been there. And the same thing with Ananda House and the same thing with the new community out there. But every single time, everyone's grateful for this beautiful temple. Oh, and the school out there. You know, there are great forces arrayed against trying to have it come to completion. It's been shot at a million times by, by all kinds of different energies. But if you know that it's trying to happen, if you feel God's encouragement, you have no choice. The surrender is in getting up and going forward anyway and watching the miracles unfold step by step by step along the way. And that's how, that's how faith grows. That's how confidence in God grows. It's how discovery of self-realization is enhanced. We have to surrender upward. We have to surrender inward into the flow of God. And when we feel God's contact, it will be as different from our usual experience of life as what's, what Master, what Yogananda wrote in that poem from a, from a world of anger and tension and hostility and aggression and distance to something that's so intimate, so beautiful, so filled with, filled with strength untold. Filled with vitality, I saw a gay, glad world with mystically open doors. And then someone will stand beside us, unseen, and whisper to us cool and clear, Hello, playmate. I am here. Let's take a moment of silence. Thy will, thy will, thy will be done. All that I am is thine. Death are one, 
Veils of thy love, thy will, thy will, thy will is thine all that I've done. We'll take our off.